Hey folks, well, it's that time again. It's time for me to do my most favorite videos that I do on this channel because they're the ones that require the least amount of effort from me. Not only is this not actually Trek Actually, this is a not actually Trek Actually comment response video where you fine people and uh, one or two of you who aren't so fine have done most of the work for me by commenting on past videos, which I will now reply to in video form. Thank you so much for doing my job for me and me still getting paid for it. That is just, is this what it's like to be a billionaire? Is this what it's like to be a billionaire? Other people do all the work and you get all the money or most of the money, uh, uh, relatively speaking, pretty much all the money, right? Is this what it's like? No wonder they're all so anti-progressive taxation. I mean, anyway, let's start out with some comments from my most recent Trek Actually video, which would be how do the economics of Star Trek actually work? And this first one from that video is from Miguel Cruz Diaz. And he says, in terms of ownership, Steve, let's not confuse private property with personal property. A house and a toothbrush would be considered personal property. Private property in communist parlance means industry and profit-making property. Just a bit of a clarification. Thanks for the video and for reading. Well, you're welcome, Miguel. I enjoy reading whenever I can, and it's nice to be able to combine my love of Star Trek with my love of reading, or at least my willingness to read. Um, yes, a lot of people brought up the distinction between private and personal property, and I appreciate the clarification. Actually, I, I did need to be corrected on that, but not for the reason that a lot of you probably thought. I am aware of the distinction between personal property and private property in, in socialist and communist theory. I have enough commie friends <laughs> that have corrected me on that, so I was aware of that. But I think what threw me off in terms of Star Trek is in the Federation, there really doesn't seem to be any such thing as a commercial property or a profit-making property. So I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, in our current society, a property like a vineyard that produced and, and distributed wine would be considered a commercial property, would be considered uh, a profit-making property. Uh, a private property rather than a personal property. But in the world of Star Trek's Federation with no money and no commerce, at least not, not commerce the way we think of it, not person-to-person -person commerce, uh, it would not be private property in the sense of a profit-making property because there is no profit because there is no selling of things in that way. So I, I, I do need to be corrected on that. I did miss that. Um, but because I failed to take into account how things are different in that way in Star Trek and because of the way the Star Trek economy works with there being no money and people not having to pay for shit. So I really, really appreciate uh, the clarification. This next one's from Adam Knack. They don't call it slavery, but the treatment of Ferengi females is definitely a slave system, right down to women being property of their fathers slash husbands. Another good catch, another thing that I probably should have found a way to mention in the video when I talked about how it's so really, really difficult for me to believe it kind of... Uh, challenges my suspension of disbelief when I am told that, oh, the Ferengi, the super capitalists of the galaxy, never practiced slavery. Uh, and a couple of people brought up points to that. One was uh, what Adam says in his comment, and what a lot of other people said as well, that, well, ask a Ferengi woman whether or not they think there's slavery in the Ferengi alliance. And also, people also brought up that it could just be that Quark is an unreliable narrator and that his view of Ferengi history, or, or perhaps the, maybe he just, maybe through no fault of his own, he was taught in school on Ferenginar that they never practiced slavery and that their version of capitalism was morally superior to those versions practiced by other civilizations. And in fact, it turns out that the truth is a lot darker than that because, hey, we have experience with that in the United States where a lot of people have a very rosy view of American history and they kind of sweep things like slavery and the gentrification and uh, the gentrification, the genocide of Native Americans and, uh, you know, Jim Crow laws and, and post-slavery racial discrimination and intolerance. They sweep all of that stuff under the rug 
you know, and say, oh, USA, let's talk about how great the presidents were and how brave our soldiers were and, and how glorious our history is. And they don't want to talk about all the dark stuff that is inextricably linked with everything else. Uh, and there's presumably some version of that on Ferenginar. So maybe Quark just honestly doesn't know that the Ferengi, w whether or not they practice slavery. So that's a good point. And also, yeah, um, the gender politics of Ferenginar are horrifying and are some of the sharpest satires, uh, or satire, I'm, I'm really killing it with the English in this video, aren't I? Some of the, some of the sharpest bits of satire uh, in Star Trek, because not only are the Ferengi uh, super capitalists who care only about uh, money and profit, but they're also uh, just dyed in the wool, bone deep, horrible misogynists who don't think that women should have rights or dignity or be able to own property or be treated as individuals at all. And it's not a coincidence that those two traits coexist, I think. I think the, the message of that is quite clear that people in our world today who tend to be right-wing, who tend to care about free markets ahead of individual rights and individual liberty and quality of life. They also tend to have very uh, retrograde views when it comes to women. And uh, that, that, is not a, that is not an accident that those two traits were married in the Ferengi when the writers of Deep Space Nine were, were building out the, the world of the Ferengi and, and developing that species and those characters and that culture. So yeah, uh, you... You think that there's no slavery on Ferenginar? Ask a Ferengi woman is a very good point. This next one is from Francois Lacombe, who says, The existence of things that cannot be replicated has always puzzled me. If something can be teleported, as gold-pressed latinum can, then it can be replicated, because a replicator is just a transporter that uses pre-recorded patterns to create objects from raw energy, instead of moving patterns of existing objects from one location to another. I think, obviously, the main reason is that it's a plot device. They, have, they had to come up with something to use for currency, and they had to explain why that kind of currency would even be possible in a future with replicators, where you could just manufacture undetectable counterfeit money whenever you wanted and completely crash whatever market or whatever economy relied on that currency. So they said, okay, they found something that can't be replicated. So there you go. So it's, it's a plot device mainly, but I think it makes sense to, and according to the internal logic of the world, I do think it, 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 it is plausible that there might be things that you could transport that you wouldn't necessarily be able to replicate because when you transport something, you're taking the, you, you have the object already and you're taking it apart and you're moving it and putting it back together. And the transporter pattern is just the computer keeping a record of where everything is so that when you reconstitute it, you are putting it back exactly the way it was when you dematerialized it. Whereas a replicator is making things from scratch. And I do think it's plausible to say, well, maybe there are certain um, certain objects, certain materials that are so complex in whatever way that it's just not feasible to replicate them. Maybe, maybe technically it would be possible, but it's just not feasible because let's say the pattern that you would need to save on file in order to do it would be so massive in order to account for all of the complexity that you would have to recreate that you just couldn't do it. And, or, or in the case of something like Gold Press Latin, where if you wanted it to pass for the real thing, the reproduction would have to be absolutely perfect. And either that technology doesn't exist because we have heard characters complain every once in a while about how replicated food, for example, isn't quite the same as quote unquote, the real thing. Um, or it's just not financially feasible. Like it just, it just doesn't work. There's just, it doesn't create a high quality convincing enough product. And for something like money, you would need it to be 100% accurate. So I do think that, that, that does make sense. If you think about it, uh, that even though the, the replicators and the transporters operate under similar principles, there are differences in what they do and how they do it. That would be relevant when you're trying to replicate something incredibly complex that you need to be 100% perfect to pass for the real thing. Here's another one from W here. Why can't an industrial replicator make an industrial replicator? Well, that would be like finding a genie and using one of your three wishes to wish for more wishes. You know, I mean, it's just against the rules.
Here's one from Bradley Potts. I always assumed Federation citizens got a certain amount of resources for free, power, a replicator, or replicator credits, housing, education, medical care, but if you wanted that nice house, like Kirk, you had to get a job and earn it. Cisco's may not have collected money from customers, but I bet everyone who entered was tracked and their accounts debited when they left. This is a suggestion that I think Rick Webb makes in his book, uh, The Economics of Star Trek, that he sort of uh, postulates that there might be some kind of a system like that in place in the Federation, that instead of, instead of monetary currency, uh, people just have energy accounts that are credited or debited based on their activities and that can be and their energy credits can be collected or spent or traded or whatever. Um, and that would help explain why everybody doesn't just have a mansion and how you could have a world where, you know, some people have bigger houses than other people or some people seem to have more uh, personal possessions or personal property than others. And, uh, and have that make sense and, and explain why that is and, and why uh, having a, an economy where basically everything is free uh, would not deplete all the resources or use up all of the, uh, you know, uh, the items that people might want. And having an, an energy accounting system so that, yes, you, you get everything you need to live, but luxuries or things that are uh, above that basic level are things that you have to save up for or have to earn in some way. I don't think that's ever been established or even really hinted at on camera. That's completely just a supposition. It's just, it's, it's headcanon to try to explain what we see, but I do think it's a pretty good suggestion. I do think uh, something like that would fit within what we have seen uh, of Star Trek. I, I don't think it would contradict anything and it would make a lot of sense and would explain how we see the world that we see uh, on Earth in, in Star Trek and how that might work. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good uh, supposition, I think. Here's another one from William Watson. Let's suppose you enter a classroom the first day and you're told no matter what you do, you'll receive an A, even if you skip class every day and never take a single test. How many students will bother to attend or take a single test? That's what a world where everyone is given all the necessities of life without having to work. I have a couple of problems with what you're saying here. First, you're saying uh, every student, no matter what, will receive an A. You're not saying every student, no matter what, will pass the class. You're saying they'll receive an A. So in your analogy, getting an A is not dying. Getting an A is having enough food and shelter and resources to survive. Having your basic necessities covered. That's getting an A. That doesn't seem right to me. <laughs> and the other thing is... Uh, I think there are some, maybe not everybody, but I do think there are some students who would come to class and would do the reading and would do the work because they want to improve themselves, because they want to learn. I went to school with, with classmates of mine who actually enjoyed the classes. And they got good grades. And there were people who got good grades because they were grade hogs and they, you know, they wanted to get the GPA as high as they could get it because they were aiming for college or because their parents demanded that of them. But there were other people, lots of fellow students of mine in, in high school and in college who did the work and enjoyed the classes and got good grades um, because they genuinely cared about the material and they wanted to learn. So I don't think you can be quite that cynical as to say, well, if everybody knew they were going to pass the class or everybody knew they were going to get an A no matter what, nobody would do any of the reading, nobody would do any of the homework. I don't think that's true. I think some people certainly would do that. They would say, well, what does it matter? I'm getting the A anyway. But I think more people than you probably would think, given how cynically framed your question is, uh, would still make an effort and try to learn things in the class because some people do genuinely care about learning and improving themselves. Here's another one from Nitty Blah Blah, the hilarious death of print media. So it's laughable when an entire workforce is gone. It's hilarious that another source of reading material gets replaced by, well, by videos like this. You know, the easy way for people to be stupid and to rely on the efforts of others. I don't know, poor choice of words to describe the loss of something that was actually good for culture in general. Maybe you won't require your kids to know how to read, get information on their own. Maybe you're okay with them relying on lazy individuals who have no skills other than sitting on their ass talking about fictional characters in a fictional world with fictional economics. Good to know my family do and will have the advantage in every aspect of life whenever lazy people like you come along. 
Hilarious death of print. Wow. Rarely do people exude their own ignorance so freely. Thanks. I agree with you, Nitty. Rarely do people exude their ignorance so freely. Of course, I wouldn't be talking about myself there. Um, a couple points I think you may have missed. First, when I added the line about the hilarious death of print media, I was referring back to my own joke. Like, you get that, right? I was kind of, I was kind of, you know, cutting my own feet off and referring back to my own joke about, you know, having Captain Kirk say, oh, they're still reading newspapers? How far back did we come, right? The hilarious death of print media is an ironic comment targeting that joke, right? I'm saying through irony, actually the death of print media isn't funny. But I didn't say that. I, I said it in a sarcastic way because I, I figured most people would get that. I figured most people who watch my videos would assume that I don't think the death... And by the way, you're kind of conflating... Well, maybe I should have made this a little bit more clear. I'm... The joke referred to the death of physical print media, of things like, like physical newspapers, like paper newspapers, right? Um, so I wasn't saying it's a good thing that all reading is going to disappear, because number one, I don't think we're in danger of that. I think media is migrating to digital platforms, not to paper uh, more and more, and you can argue over whether or not that's a good thing or not, but there's still plenty of opportunities for people to read, and people should read. Reading is fundamental, as some people have, have said in the past, and I'm certainly not going to argue otherwise. And my God, I would never, ever, ever want to forsake reading if the result of that would be giving people like you the advantage. Because based on your general reaction to that joke and your attitude in this comment, people like you are certainly not the people I want to have advantaged in society over other people. So God help us if you are the only ones who are reading in the future and the rest of us are just watching dumb YouTube videos like this. We're gonna be in a lot of fucking trouble. So I definitely did not mean to imply that. And I'm really sorry that my ironic comment against my own joke, went over your head so far and got you this upset. It's really going to trouble me for quite some time. Here's another one from the Economics of Star Trek video by Contra Zombie 4 Honestly, I'm not too sure a system where all your basic living requirements, food, water, shelter, clothes, healthcare, are met, would be all that great. Even though poverty and sickness might be eliminated, so too would be motivation. Honestly, we've already taken out the need to do whatever it takes to survive. If we take out trying to live comfortably as well, what do we strive for? For real, suggestions are welcome. Once we take out the need to work to live a comfortable existence, what is our goal? There were a couple of comments that were sort of like this on the video. Uh, for one thing, we do have an entire class of citizens in our society who are in this exact situation. And we call them rich people. There are people who, who either have earned enough money or inherited enough money or have enough wealth right now that they don't have to work for the rest of their lives. They're good. Their basic necessities are covered till the day they die, and they probably have enough that it'll cover their kids' basic necessities too. So we, we have many such people in our society right now. They're not very large as a percentage, but in terms of numbers, lots of people are in that situation. They have enough money to last them the rest of their lives. They don't need to worry about where their food, shelter, health care, etc. are going to come from. And some of those people are worthless, and they sit on their asses all day, or they just lead hedonistic lifestyles that do no good for anybody, and they're just horrible human beings, and I wouldn't want to spend five minutes in a room with any of them. But there are still people who are motivated to work. Or, and, and sometimes they don't, they're not always, you know, they're not, they're not doing manual labor. They're not doing, uh, you know, janitorial work or anything like that. But they're, they have a busy schedule. They're out doing things that are, that, that are constructive, that are creative, right? They don't have to. And they certainly don't have to in order to survive, but they do it anyway because it gives their life meaning in some way. And I submit that that is what the motivation would have to be in a society where basic needs are met, where we don't have to work in order to survive. And even if, if, uh, if the post-scarcity economy gets to a point where standard of living rises high enough for everybody that we don't even have to work to have a comfortable existence, we have that as a baseline. Then the challenge becomes, as Captain Picard says to uh, Ralph Offenhouse in the Neutral Zone episode that I referenced in that video, the challenge becomes improving yourself. The challenge becomes finding meaning for your own life. 
finding purpose for your own life. I've, I've encountered this uh, problem with a lot of folks when I, when I would have conversations with people about atheism versus religion. M myself being an atheist, um, people who are from a more religious background and are used to looking at the world through, through that perspective, they would say, well, what's the meaning of life? Like, what does your life mean? If you don't believe that you're a child of God, if you don't believe that you were put on this earth by, by an omnipotent creator and you're not part of a, of a divine plan, then what does your life mean? What is your purpose? Isn't, isn't existence meaningless? And my answer is no, my existence means whatever it means to me. Like I give my life meaning through the work that I do, through the friends that I have, through the battles that I fight, through the people that I love, through the experiences I have, through what is important to me, through the things that I learn, through the things that I'm able to do for other people and contribute. All of those things give my life a unique meaning. And I think if you were in a situation where you didn't have to work in order to survive, most people, I think, would still probably want to find something to do. Something to do with their time. Whether it was creative or, or, or constructive or, or whatever. I feel like most people, not everybody, I'm sure there would, just like with, with rich people, there would be people who would just lay around and do nothing. But I think most people would want to find something to do with their time, some way to contribute, some way to create something, some way to make something. Um, I just think that would be, I just, I, maybe I'm just not that pessimistic. I'm not that cynical, but I think that would be the case in a lot more of people's lives than, than a lot of folks seem to assume. And here's one more from that economics video. It's from Madison Livingston. You have way too much time on your hands. Actually, I don't really. I, I don't have nearly as much free time as this comment would suggest. I'm doing this shit most of the time. Now here are some comments on my video responding to the Star Trek Picard trailer. This first one is from Charles Jones. Anti-railing kill technology? Oh man, where's the fun in that? I know, right? I mean, just imagine how different space mutiny would have been if they had had that technology installed on the southern sun. This next one is from T Prime. You're going to have to live with this a long time. The choice is simple. You can live with it below the sea with Lewis or above the clouds with the Enterprise. Season four, episode two, family. And pardon my accent, I was doing my best Jeremy Kemp there, and unfortunately Jeremy just uh, passed away about a month ago. Uh, Jeremy Kemp, of course, the wonderful actor who played Robert Picard on that episode of uh, TNG, which is who that quote is from. And I, there's not a question there or anything, I just wanted to include that because Robert Picard is legitimately my favorite one-off guest character, probably in all of Star Trek. I adore that episode of TNG, and I think uh, Jeremy Kemp as Picard's older brother, Robert, is just wonderful, and such a great character and such a great performance. Uh, so rest in peace, Mr. Kemp. And that was a hell of a performance and a hell of a character. Here's one from Kelly Carjola. Steve, if you watched just the two-part episodes of Star Trek Voyager, do you think that you might have liked it just based on the two-part episodes? A bit off topic there, Kelly, on a video about the Picard trailer, but I'll let it slide because it gives me a chance to knock Voyager and since when am I passing those up? <laughs> um... You know, I really don't think my opinion of Voyager would change all that much if I was only basing it on the two-part episodes. You mentioned, and, and a part of your comment that I cut off uh, of the bit that I read and put on screen there, you listed all of the two-parters, and uh, you mentioned the pilot, uh, Caretaker, which is a double episode, and, and I think that's a very strong episode, and certainly a really strong pilot. And then you also mentioned um, Future's End, which is the one where they go back in time to 1996 Los Angeles, and that's a fun episode. But most of the other ones, I don't really like all that much. Um, I know some of them are really well liked by a lot of folks in the fan base, like Dark Frontier and Scorpion. Um, but no, I've other than those ones I just mentioned, Futures End and the Pilot Caretaker, I, I'm really not terribly impressed by the two parters on Voyager. So no, I don't think my opinion of it would really change all that much one way or the other if I was basing it solely on the two part episodes. This one is from Philip Boniello. Patrick Stewart is going to get the Mark Hamill TLJ treatment in this new Picard series. 
Oh, does that mean he's going to give an outstanding performance in a role that will complete his character's long-term character arc in a way that is incredibly exciting and dramatically satisfying? Because that's what Mark Hamill did in The Last Jedi with Luke Skywalker, unless somebody has a different opinion. I would love if Patrick Stewart slash Picard got the Mark Hamill treatment from The Last Jedi in Picard, because I thought Luke slash Hamill were handled tremendously well in The Last Jedi. I thought The Last Jedi was a great movie, a great Star Wars movie, and I thought it did right by Luke. So there! If Picard does right by Picard the same way Last Jedi and Ryan Johnson did right by Luke Skywalker, then I will be a very happy Trekkie. So that in your lightsaber and smoke it. Maybe you made a bong out of the lightsaber. I don't know. I didn't think that one through. Here's one from Brazilian Goddess. I love how happy and positive you are in your videos. I actually found your channel after getting sick of hearing really negative Trek videos. Oh gee, I've been kind of negative in some of these comment responses this time, haven't I? I better start positiving it up. Uh, well, thank you. Actually, I, you know, I've, I noticed that too, and not just with Star Trek stuff, but a lot of sort of self-styled media critics who do YouTube videos seem to think that criticism uh, consists of just being super negative about things, of just talking about how much you think things suck. And I mean, it, part of the job of a critic is if you don't like something, you should say you don't like it and be able to articulate the things about it you don't like. But there's nothing uncritical about liking something if you can describe how you like it. Like being a critic basically is just figuring out what you think and feel in response to something and then articulating those thoughts and feelings. That's what being a critic is at its most basic level. And if those feelings are positive, if you watch a movie or a TV show and you have very positive feelings or thoughts after watching it, that's okay. You can still be a critic. Like, you don't have to go digging for shit to, to be negative about. So, yeah, I mean, I love Star Trek. Even parts of it that I don't think are that great. Even parts of it that I find mediocre or underwhelming. Like, as a whole, as a franchise, I love Star Trek. Watching it and talking about it makes me happy. It adds to the enjoyment of my life. If I hated it, I wouldn't talk about it. There's lots of things that I hate. I don't make videos about them, unless it's something important. If it's something like political or cultural that I feel like needs to be addressed, then I'll make a video about it. But if we're talking about like a TV show that I really hate, I don't make videos about that. Because, you know, why would I spend time on something that I hate? And if I am going to spend time talking about the negative aspects of something that I love, like Star Trek, I am at least going to try to do it in such a way so that my love of the thing isn't completely buried. Because that's not honest. And I just don't think videos like that are fun to watch. Why, who wants to watch somebody just be hateful about something? Especially something relatively frivolous like Star Trek. Like, I just, I don't get that. I don't get the appeal of that. I don't get how those videos are fun to make. And I do not want to make those videos. So I'm very, very glad to have found people like you in my audience who feel the same way and, and appreciate what I try to do. So thank you very much. This next one is from Platypie007. 10 episodes of Captain Picard and the Ensign's Log podcast. Just got done semi-binging the backlog of that, by the way, and am loving it. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, Jason and I uh, love doing the Ensign's Log. Here's a little uh, premature pitch for it, for those of you who haven't listened to it. Uh, myself and Jason Harding co-host a Star Trek-themed comedy podcast called The Ensign's Log. The link is in the description of this video and is linked in the descriptions of all of the Trek Actually videos. So if you haven't checked it out, please check it out. I, I think you'll like it if you enjoy the Star Trek stuff that I do. It's just an absolute blast. It's so much fun to make, and, and uh, we're really, really proud of that show. And... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we right now we're we're our show is set during the classic Trek episodes, and I think I'm pretty sure after we get to the end of classic Trek, we are going to jump to Next Generation. 
um, and then sort of make our way through the other shows at that point. But when we get to Discovery and Picard, I'm not quite sure how we're going to handle that. I'm not quite sure if we're just going to wrap it up at that point and say, last episode, thanks for listening, everybody, or if we're going to find a way to have shows set during Discovery or have shows set during Picard that would make sense for our characters and for the stories we tell. Uh, we're way, way off for that. Like, who knows if we'll even get that far. But yeah, maybe we will do episodes set, uh, you know, parallel to uh, the Picard show. That would be a lot of fun, maybe, depending on how the Picard show turns out. <laughs> Here's one from Veggie Hater. Plot twist, the janitor Picard keeps accidentally calling is Wesley Crusher. Oh boy, I love when people follow up and add to my jokes. Yeah, that would be really funny. And a uh, further plot twist, Wesley is working as the janitor on the Enterprise in the Fleet Museum because that's his current lesson from the Traveler who sent him back to Earth to get a menial job so that he could discover the dignity of work. And that's why people in the Federation economy work menial jobs. Because they are apprenticed to godlike beings who transcend time and space like the Traveler, and they have been sent to do menial tasks so that they can discover the dignity of work. Now it all makes sense. Here's one from Lawrence Morkberg, Borg Queen and Data Kiss Passionately. Data removes a mini USB dongle and gingerly inserts it into a port on the Queen. Would you like to mount new hardware? Yes. God bless you, Lawrence Markberg. This next one is from my previous comment response video, and it's from Bell5574. As I said, I agree with your political take on Trek's message. What do you think of Trek's overall religious message? figuring out what Trek's overall religious message is, is a much more complicated business than figuring out the political messages. I think the, the Federation that we are presented with in Star Trek seems to be mostly a post-religious society. Religion doesn't appear to play a very large role in the lives of most people. But we have seen in, in certain characters, and I'm, I'm not just talking about Bajorans or, or other non-Federation cultures that have a rich religious life, but uh, people in Federation culture, like for instance, uh, Captain Pike that we see uh, in Discovery knows about churches, knows about religion, seems to come from a, a somewhat of a, of a faith-based background. Um, so religion still exists on Earth in the 23rd and 24th centuries. It doesn't seem to occupy quite the same status uh, or quite the same place in the cultural life of, of, of the planet as a whole as it does now. But it still exists, and it still gives meaning to people's lives. And if the message of Star Trek is that if we could somehow divorce tribalism and nationalism and, and prejudice from our religious institutions, and we could just have religion for people who want it, for people who need it, as another way of giving value and meaning to life, then that would be a wonderful thing. And there would be not a thing in the world wrong with that. The problem with religion is that, like many other human institutions, I don't mean to lay this all exclusively at the feet of religion because I don't think that's fair, but religion is a human institution, and like every other human institution, religion is vulnerable to prejudice and intolerance and tribalism and, and being used as an excuse to make war or to hate people or, or for religious adherents to place themselves above other groups. And if we could ever get over all of those issues, religion, whether you believe that it's true or not, just culturally, spiritually, religion could be a very positive, very powerful force for good in the lives of people. And I, as an atheist, am completely, am completely on board with that. Right? I would never begrudge a peaceful, tolerant, loving person their religion. I would view that as a trivial disagreement between the two of us. If I think there is no God and they think there is a God and they're a wonderful person who makes the world a better place by being here, I, I have no quarrel with them whatsoever. I would like to think that, that we could be friends and allies if it came to that. Um, and I feel like that's the image, the, the glimpses of religion that we get from Star Trek. I think that is probably something like the message, that, that, that sincerely faithful people who use their religion as a motivation to pursue peace and love and cooperation and tolerance 
and that in, in those instances, religion is a very wonderful, positive thing. And, and if I am correct in that, if that is a reasonable reading of Star Trek's religious values, of Star Trek's religious message, then, then I am completely on board with that. But as I said, it's a lot more difficult to come by than the political message. Because Star Trek does talk about religion, but it doesn't talk about religion nearly as much as it talks about politics. Now, these next couple ones are from my video on why Star Trek Insurrection is actually not that bad. This one is from Daniel Schubert Skelly. While I like your channel and agree with you on so many things, this included, I'm sorry, but the reboots are crap, and while I won't enjoy it, I guess I'll have to fight you. Well, I, I suppose I did bring this on myself, Daniel. I did say that if people had a problem with me listing Star Trek Beyond as one of the best Star Trek movies, that they should fight me. So I guess, you know, if, if it's come to this, then it's come to this. This one's from Avidman42. Star Trek Beyond was fucking amazing. Fight me. Aha! What do you think now, Daniel? Huh? What, you, where's your big talk now? You think you can take on both of us? You think you can take me and Avidman42? I'd love to see it. Come on! Come on! Avid Man 42, you've got my back, right? Because I kind of shot my mouth off there. Like, if you're, you're going to back me up because oh, I should have asked you first. I should have confirmed that. This one's from Major Grin. Only 600 people, not their own planet, lived for hundreds of years already. Why not relocate them to save trillions of people in the Federation, especially in the middle of the Dominion War with millions of injured and disabled people that this radiation could cure instantly? I think Picard made the wrong choice. In the original plan, the Baku would be relocated in a hollow ship, not even knowing they were relocated, so it even won't affect their culture in any way. They will only notice that decades later when they start aging naturally again. Why should they be the only ones to get those medical benefits and deny it of others? 600 versus a trillion lives. And those 600 can still enjoy it as well. They should just share it with others. You know, I don't pretend that this is a, a black and white issue and there are plenty of complications that the movie doesn't really address, and that, to be fair, I didn't address in my video either, like the fact that uh, the Baku, the native or, or supposedly native population that are supposed to get all the sympathy are 100% are white people, where, or, or at least very, very largely white people. I think you might be able to catch a non-white face here and there in the background in the Baku village, but certainly all of the featured Baku are, are white people, and that, 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 that isn't usually how it goes in, in human history, is it? Most of the time, especially in recent history over the last few centuries, when a population has been forcibly relocated or genocided, they haven't been white people, have they? Um, and uh, the other thing is that, yeah, th I guess I suppose you could say that they weren't technically native to that planet because they, they did not evolve there. They, they moved there. From, they settled there from somewhere else. But... I mean, Native American tribes who were here in North America when European settlers first came, or European explorers first came, uh, they did not evolve on this continent. They came to this continent from other places as well. We would still consider them a native population because they were already here when others arrived, and they had been here a long time. They had been here long enough to put down roots and raise families and have generations and generations and generations of people and, and establish a culture. And even though the Baku are very long-lived and don't seem to have the same kind of generational existence as, as other people, they seem to have settled in on that planet pretty well and have been there for a long time. And it just doesn't seem fair for a government to come in and say, well, you have something we want, so get lost. And especially to do it under false pretenses, to, to beam them away without them even knowing about it. That doesn't make it better. That makes it worse. That makes it so much worse. Uh, so, and as far as, you know, why, why should they get the benefits of, of immortality and other people don't? I mean, again, I don't pretend that that is an easy question, but, but let me ask you, uh, if, if, there are, if there's an emergency room full of people who all have various life-threatening injuries or illnesses and they all need organ transplants and you are 
the most convenient available organ donor, the only one who could possibly save all their lives, and you just so happen to be a compatible donor to all of those patients, well, why should you keep your organs? when your organs could be used to save all of those lives. All of these people will live. Yes, you will die, but all of these people will live. So why shouldn't the doctors just strap you down and just harvest your organs, whether you want them to or not? I mean, the needs of the many, right? This one is from Paul Scott. You missed covering what went down while Riker and Geordi went off with the Enterprise, in which Geordi is like, hey, you know, man, Picard bet me that you aren't shit without your beard. And Riker goes, you know what? I don't need to take that crap from you. Now do your damn job and throw the warp core at that ship annihilating threat coming right at us while I power slide the ship to destroy those Sona ships. Beard be fucking damned. Okay, you know what, Paul? I'll, I'll write the jokes. In, in the Trek Actually videos. I, I can write my own breezy, conversational, flippant episode summaries and, and dialogue and stuff. Like, I, I don't need you to do that shit for me, okay? I'll, I'll call you if I need help. But that was really good. I like that a lot. This one is from my episode about uh, why Jordy LaForge actually deserved better. It's from MTG Packrat. Did he deserve better? His character was written to be an asshole. I actually think you could make a whole video of every moment he was a jackass in the show. Numerous times he seemed to bark, snip, or yell at someone when it wasn't even close to justified. Yeah, I know what you mean. I, I was actually thinking about such an incident earlier today. I was thinking of the episode Relics with Scotty, and Scotty's kind of getting on Jordy's nerves for the whole episode, and then finally Jordy has enough, and he just kind of tells Scotty where to go, and Scotty's gives this just amazing, appalled reaction to Jordy's response, where he's just like, you know, and Scotty's like, I was driving starships while your great-grandfather was still in diapers. And Jordy's just like, you know, like, and uh, yeah, that's kind of a dick move on Jordy's behalf. But then again, you can kind of see where Jordy's coming from. The, the problem I have with what you're saying, I don't think, yes, I, his character was written to be an asshole, but his character wasn't consciously written to be an asshole. I don't think the writers of TNG would get to a script and say, okay, now let's see, now let's make Jordy an asshole. I think Jordy is supposed to be a nice, likable guy. And most of the time he is. Most of the time I find him to be a nice, likable guy. I think those instances where he comes off as a jerk are instances of lazy writing or poor writing or lack of awareness on the part of the writers of how Jordy is coming across in this scene. I don't think he's meant to be an asshole. And that's where the complication comes in for me. I, I do think, and I, I pointed out in, in the video where Jordy behaves completely inappropriately with Leia Brahms. But I don't think the writers were writing it thinking, let's make Jordy a huge asshole creep. Um, and I don't think they were writing Jordy in those other instances where he's where he's acting like a dick. When they were thinking, ah, Jordy's the dick. Let's write some more Jordy dick scenes. Like I don't think, you know, that that's what they were doing. And they definitely weren't writing Jordy dick scenes in any other sense of that phrase. Here's another one from that Jordy video from Luke I Rot. Hold the phone. Did he just call men's rights activists rapey creeps? Oh, did you miss that? Did you not hear that properly? I'm happy to repeat myself. Uh, men's rights activists are rapey creeps, and they can all kiss my ass. The whole men's rights movement is garbage, and they can all go to hell on my dime, as far as I'm concerned. Screw men's rights activists. I hope this clears up any ambiguity that you may have about my feelings towards men's rights activists or anti-feminists in general. They can all go to hell. And finally, this one is from my video about what might have happened if Tasha Yar had not been killed off. It's from Andy Tay. What a stupid what if. Tasha was killed due to Denise Crosby not wanting to be on Star Trek The Next Generation anymore. She did die. However, she was brought back by yesterday's Enterprise. So any surmisal not to that effect is purely speculative conjecture and does not follow canon. You really seem to have gotten the premise of the video down 100%, Andy, and I'm glad to see that. Yes, my video was not canon, and it was not meant to be canon, 
it did acknowledge the reasons why Denise Crosby left the show. And I believe I did mention that, that she came back and played Tasha uh, on yesterday's Enterprise at, at some point, even though that wasn't a major part uh, of, uh, of, the, of the video. The, the point of the video was, was to examine how the death of Tasha and the removal of that character changed Star Trek The Next Generation. And according to my thesis in that video, actually gave the writers and the producers the the push that they needed to make changes in the creative of the show and actually started it on its path to becoming a really, really good show. See, see, that's what the video was about. It wasn't about uh, just, you know, doing like fan theory speculation. It was, it was an attempt to examine the impact that that one creative decision had on the series going forward and, and how important that was to, to the series as a whole. So I apologize if you think I was trying to, to present my speculations or my analysis as, as canon, or, or if you are, are just that, uh, that upset by any discussion of Star Trek that, that, that goes outside the lines of established canon. If that is the case, you probably shouldn't watch my other Star Trek videos, because I'm, I'm somewhat irreverent when it comes to the concept of canon in the first place. So you might not be very happy if you watch too many more of my videos. Um, well, that was the last comment. Thank you all so, so much for watching. As always, I want to remind you, if you enjoy these videos that I do, you can help me out by becoming a supporter of this channel through Patreon, going to patreon.com slash Steve Shives. Uh, you can pledge anything from $1 a month on up, and all of those pledges help me out tremendously. But if you pledge $5 a month or more, you do earn yourself a shout out at the end of scripted Trek Actually videos, so that's something to consider. Um, and for a Patreon pledge of any amount, you get to vote in the polls that choose future Trek Actually topics. And there is such a poll that is open on my Patreon page right now to choose the Trek Actually topic for October, because the Trek Actually topic for September has, uh, has already been chosen. And it is about the times when Star Trek was not actually as progressive as it might have wanted to be, or as we the fans might have wanted it to be. So that'll hopefully be an interesting episode. Uh, thank you all for watching. Thank you all so, so much for the comments. No hard feelings to those of you who I was a little uh, rough on, uh, except for maybe the men's rights activist guy. But uh, other than that, thank you all so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you next time. Take care, everybody.